in order to affect the political will of states, we need to develop new strategies beyond law reform and community education. So I've developed a theoretical mo model based on empathy. And you may wonder why the neuroscience of empathy? Well, it's because it has the ability to disrupt the beliefs and behaviors that lead to discrimination. Discrimination is a function of the mind and we need to influence how the mind works in order to reduce, reduce gender inequality. This relates specifically to Article 5 of CEDAW. Because discrimination and empathy are both relational uh, aspects. They're both about how we relate to one another. And we need to change the way we relate in order to reduce uh, discrimination. Um, Attempts at undoing stereotypes and biases after they're already formed is futile. We, once we've formed a discrimination, it's very, very hard to undo it. So they've done studies already that, that have established that as they build empathy between mother and child, this through mimicking behaviours, through, through mothers and fathers following the behaviour and the emotions of the child affects long-term outcomes. Um, and this can be exemplified, remember um, in Romania, where they had the orphanages after the Ceausescu regime, where children were not cuddled, were not interacted with, they had very long-term social emotional problems. Um, and so it was a really poor outcome, but when children and adults have that really healthy interaction, they're less biased in the long run. That law and education are still important, but we need to be brave enough to look at new avenues because at the, at, right at this day, it will take centuries to overcome gender equality if we stay on the same pathway. We need to look at new pathways if we're ever going to make substantial change. Welcome, friends, to season two of Gender Equality Talks. As we know, we've been listening to 90 for 90 global voices for gender equality and human rights. Today, we have amongst us a very special guest, Michaela Guthrich. Michaela is a gender and women's human rights advocate with 16 years of experience in social justice uh, at local level, at global level, in research and advocacy projects with a particular focus on sexual and other forms of gender-based violence, human trafficking, forced marriage, and indigenous people's issues. Currently, she's undertaking a PhD at Monash University entitled Missing Microfeminisms, Understanding the Role of Effective Empathy, in promoting the CEDAW principles of equality and non-discrimination. Those of you who are not familiar, CEDAW is a globally binding treaty, which most of our governments, barring very few nations, including US have not signed, but most of our nations have. And uh, so Michaela is amongst us who will help us understand. She's also a teaching associate with Faculty of Business and Economics at Monash University. So welcome Michaela, a great honor to have you amongst us. Thanks for that introduction, Bobby. Thank you. So, Michaela, uh, please help us understand the connect between effective empathy, neuroscience, uh, and uh, you know gender inequality. And uh, the other follow-up question is, how can it help in advancing progress on legally binding treaties such as CEDAW? Thank you so much for the question. Yes, I mean, I'm glad you introduced CEDAW there because even though it's a remarkable document and it has achieved so much is a landmark document for women's rights activists, there is still a lack of enforcement and there are wide ranging reservations in terms of uh, the rights of women. However, we can look, we, because of this, we need to look at new approaches in order to influence the political will of states. Um, so in order to affect the political will of states, we need to develop new strategies beyond law reform and community education. So I've developed a theoretical mo model based on empathy. And you may wonder why the neuroscience of empathy? Well, it's because it has the ability to disrupt the beliefs and behaviors that lead to discrimination. Discrimination is a function of the mind 
and we need to influence how the mind works in order to reduce, reduce gender inequality. This relates specifically to Article 5 of CEDAW. Article 5 of CEDAW is about stereotyping. It, it calls for all countries to not necessarily eliminate, but to modify stereotypes. And then it also backs that up with Article 2 through laws and Article 10 through education. But it doesn't contemplate the neuroscience of effective empathy. And that's where my model comes in. And one of the reasons why we believe it will be effective is because discrimination and empathy are both relational uh, aspects. They're both about how we relate to one another. And we need to change the way we relate in order to reduce uh, discrimination. Stereotypes in, in terms of Article 5 has the capacity to, to catalyze feminist revolution. It's that important, but so few organizations have a focus on Article 5 stereotyping. And if they do, they focus on laws and education, which is now becoming seen to not be as effective as we th first thought. The operalization of Article 5 is very poor at this stage but it has transformative power. Um, like I said, stereotyping is a function of the brain. So we need to tap into this root cause and, uh, and reconstruct uh, our minds in a way that doesn't bias in terms of gender. Empathy has already been proven to be linked strongly with pro-social outcomes. So we believe it will also have the pro-social outcome of treating each other equally. Um, in terms of empathy, there's two types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy and effective empathy. I focused on effective empathy because that's about feeling what somebody else's feels, whereas cognitive empathy is about understanding how another feels. So diff they're different processes that work together. Um, they're also uh, driven by different areas of the brain. Uh, cognitive empathy covers around five regions of the brain, while effective empathy uses what's called the mirror neuron system. And the mirror neuron system um, is the same where you're both performing an act or observing somebody else performing an act. And we believe it is this process that can generate equality between people. Um, the model that I've developed of effective empathy has three substrates, intersubjectivity, which just is about how we relate to one another, multisensory engagement, and empathic embodiment. And empathic embodiment is an internal process. It's not external, like some campaigns that use uh, a hijab for the day or they they pl pr pretend to be blind for a day. It's not those sort of things because that's external. It's about embodying somebody internally and making it a part of your function of your brain. Um, so if we develop empathy, this prevents the manifestation of bias. It is not a tool to be used for actual discrimination. Say if somebody is homeless and they need a house, this model doesn't address that. This model is targeted towards um, the relation between us that we don't discriminate against each other. Discrimination happens within milliseconds of a glance. So how do we tap into that millisecond? so that we don't discriminate just by looking at somebody. And we believe that's through empathy. Um, attempts at undoing stereotypes and biases after they're already formed is futile. We, once we've formed a discrimination, it's very, very hard to undo it. So we propose doing it before the stereotypes and biases form. So we're talking about primary school children learning empathy so that when they relate to each other and grow up as functional members of society, they don't discriminate against each other. Um, and the, 
although the, the framework is at the moment theoretical, we propose to actually start doing some empirical studies in order to validate the model. So we, we have spoken to people about the model and, and got their feedback. And we have done a quantitative study to test the relationship between gender bias and empathy. And we have found the two uh, do have a relationship. We, in that study, we didn't establish what that relationship was, just that there was a relationship. So we know we're heading in the right direction, but the next step is to actually test the model and see if uh, children are taught empathy, will this reduce their bias? Not only gender bias, but it can affect other biases as well, including race bias. So it can take an intersectional approach. It won't be just bias towards women, it would be reducing bias against uh, women with disabilities and all sorts of intersectional approaches. Um, uh, going back to the, the substrates of uh, the model that we've discovered, I said it's got intersubjectivity, multi-sensory engagement, and the multi-sensory engagement means you can immerse yourself in the situation whether that's done through virtual reality or other uh, platforms to help you immerse yourself in it. But it doesn't have to be complicated like virtual reality. You might have experienced um, effective empathy in very simple ways. When you go to a sports ground or a church or a political rally, quite often there's chance to get everybody feeling the same feeling, whether it's a religious song or a football uh, anthem or something like that, that, that breeds community spirit. And we hope that those kind of mechanisms that happen in the brain during that time, if we can replicate that, we can reduce gender bias. Thank you so much, Michaela, uh, for helping us understand uh, the connect between uh, you know, effective empathy and how can we use it to advance gender equality and also in progress on, on, on declarations and commitments for gender equality and human rights. So let us hope that your work uh, you know, goes forward and uh, is really becomes pivotal for advancing gender equality and human yeah. rights. The main paper that we've written um, has been accepted for publication at Human Rights Review. So if anybody's interested, once it's published, we can pass that forward. It's just going through pre-production at the moment. And we do hope that it does affect things like that you've mentioned, stigmas against people with HIV. I certainly think it can be applied in that way as well. But this is such a new way of thinking about uh, addressing gender bias. It, it moves beyond law reform and community education and really digs down into how we think and how we feel. And if we can get the political will of the state to think differently about women, maybe we can start something really great. Let's hope and look forward to that publication once it happens and we'll definitely share. So, uh, Michaela, what challenges do you foresee in the neuroscience of effective empathy being adopted in different contexts? I think when people might be introduced to it, they may equate the model with uh, brainwashing. Um, but I think when they see the type of applications that we're proposing, they're very easy to come on board with. We're talking about uh, teaching children empathy or teaching adolescents through um, app games on their phone or starting uh, clubs where children have to work towards things like intersubjectivity and empathic embodiment. So they're not confronting ways to address uh, gender bias. We're not talking about, it, we, it's not even necessary to talk about gender to the children. If they, if they start with a base of empathy, it affects everything else. They don't have to start talking to children about the fact that girls are treated differently to boys or that trans women are treated different to cisgender women or things like that. They're not issues that need to be discussed. Uh, so it is age appropriate. And we think that 
that uh, there can be some really simple games that children can play um, that are non-confronting that will teach them these skills. So it, we advocate for, for play-based learning um, and we think that that can be uh, uh, opera, operationalized by technology. So even, even now in the global north and the global south, um, people do have phones and they have services like that, that they can use um, to, treat, uh, to treat discrimination through empathy. Um, but there's many ways that can be done in manual ways as well. It actually starts when a mother and a child connect to one another, right from, from the, they've done studies where they found right from the moment you're born, you're learning empathy through the, through the relationship that you're building with the parent. So they've done studies already that, that have established that as they build empathy between mother and child, this through mimicking behaviours, through, through mothers and fathers following the behaviour and the emotions of the child affects long-term outcomes. Um, and this can be exemplified. Remember um, in Romania, where they had the orphanages after the Ceausescu regime, where children were not cuddled, were not interacted with, they had very long-term social emotional problems. Um, and so it was a really poor outcome. But when children and adults have that really healthy interaction, they're less biased in the long run. And I think um, the women's rights advocates can harness this knowledge to, to influence change in many ways. Yeah, let's hope that happens. Um, very important recommendations or suggestions, Michaela. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, Michaela, anything else which you would like to add uh, in terms of advancing work in this direction? The important thing for me, I, I did mention briefly, is to now validate the research by uh, doing some practical experiments. But it's really important to me and my uh, uh, fellow researchers that have been working on this is that we make it relevant to many sectors of the community, whether it's the global north and the global south, different sectors working on different issues, whether they're working on health related issues, like you mentioned HIV and things like that, that we apply in many ways. So I suppose uh, one thing that I'd call your audience to is if they're, seek if they're interested in collaboration, then please come forward. Or even if they just wanna have a conversation to begin with, to see how their work can actually influence my work or vice versa, I'm very open to new discussions with women rights activists wherever they live. Thank you so much, Michaela. Any, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I think uh, just that law and education are still important but we need to be brave enough to look at new avenues because at the, at, right at this day, it will take centuries to overcome gender equality if we stay on the same pathway. We need to look at new pathways if we're ever gonna make substantial change. Yeah. Absolutely, totally agree. Like, you know, we can't accept what the pace at which we are addressing gender equality and human rights. And in some contexts, we are going back. Um, mm -hmm. uh, friends, those who may not have uh, followed United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres had said in March 2023 that it will take 300 years, and that is a UN Women report, 300 years at the current pace if, uh, to achieve gender equality. Uh, like, you know, this is not acceptable. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Think how many women are going to die between now and 300 years. That's a huge blight on our society, and we need to make radical change. Right. Absolutely. We need to make radical change. And it's not just girls and women in other gender diverse communities. It's also men who, who you know, like they, they, they also need to understand and unlearn the harmful, uh, you know, gender norms and social norms, which are so, in, you know, we, we, we just, they just get inside our head and minds. And of course, in our behaviors and what we do and how we think. And Michaela is trying to address it right here. 
So yeah. thanks a lot, Michaela, for that. And yeah. let us hope that happens and ex accelerates progress. Yeah, over, you wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah I, I think it, teaching boys how to empathize is a really radical proposition because it's not accepted that men are empathetic, but this could make a change that sees uh, less women affected by things like domestic violence. If they can empathize with a women, women's point of view, will they actually be able to perpetrate the crimes that they're currently committing? Yeah, let us hope that they empathize because there is no other future except that we have to end all forms of violence and go for gender equality and human rights so that all gender diverse communities, everyone can live with dignity, you know, in a socially just and ecologically sustainable manner. Thanks a lot, Michaela Guthridge, for joining us. Friends, you were listening to Michaela Guthridge, as we as we know that um, you know, and those who have joined us late, she's a gender and women's human rights advocate with 16 years of experience in social justice, local and global research and advocacy projects. Uh, with a particular focus on sexual and other forms of gender-based violence, human trafficking, forced marriage, and indigenous people's issues. She's uh, currently undertaking a PhD at Monash University uh, and, and also a teaching associate in, uh, at Monash. So thanks a lot, Michaela, for your time. All the best to you and all the power to you and look forward to re reading that publication and using it and leveraging it as much as possible for us. So thanks a lot. All the thanks best. so much, Thank Bobby. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye.